game. And we're going to go up to 88 miles per hour and go back in time. So where are we going? We are going to the 1970s. So why are we going here? Well, in the 1970s, this is the first time that pterygoid implants were utilized. And at this point in time, Linkow, uh, Han, and uh, a number of other implant pioneers were utilizing uh, subperiosteal implants, blade implants. And in particular with the subperiosteal implants, you know, what they found was that in the posterior maxilla, you know, we know that the bone is, is soft, the bone is thin with pneumatized sinuses, and they were not getting very good support. And what they realized even, you know, uh, close to 50 years ago was that if they were to extend their uh, subperiosteal style implants to the pterygomaxillary complex, that they could engage and utilize this very dense, hard type one bone and get much greater support for their uh, subperiosteal style implants. And throughout the 70s, Linkow had published a number of articles as well as a number of different art, uh, other authors um, where they utilized the pterygoid extension implant to provide additional support for their full arch restorations. So, you know, this concept goes back, you know, half a century. So, uh, you know, very well documented. Now we get in our time machine and we're going to go a little bit further forward. We're going to land in the late 80s, 90s, and the 2000s. So at this point in time, you know, pterygoid implants um, utilized for subperiosteal style frames started to fall out of favor because as the subperiosteal implants began to wane, we had the root form implants begin to take hold. And so during the 80s, there was not very much published in terms of pterygoid implants, just a handful of articles. However, in 1989, 1992, Telasny described use of the root form implants uh, in terms of utilization for the pterygoid. And so what they did was they engaged the pterygomaxillary complex with the root form implant, which is a little different than what um, Link Howe and Han and some of the other uh, pioneers that were utilizing the subperiosteal frame style implants, you know, those were, you know, essentially sitting on top of the, you know, hard type one bone of the pterygomaxillary complex. But when Telasny, you know, described the root form uh, concept, you know, this implant was now actually actively engaging the pterygomaxillary complex. So utilizing the same bone, but in a different uh, technique. And other doctors, such as uh, Dr. Balshi, Grays, Valeron Rodriguez, Peña Rocha, uh, Curry, uh, they uh, published a number of articles where they're starting to utilize uh, the pterygomaxillary complex for uh, support for restorations. Now, most of these articles published during uh, the 90s, the 2000s, these were all delayed load protocols. Uh, so very few, there's a handful, you know, uh, of mentions of utilization of the pterygomaxillary complex for immediate load, but most of these articles were all a delayed load protocol. And some of the earlier studies, uh, you know, they were utilizing implants that had machine surfaces, uh, non-end cutting surfaces. And so their early success rates were not quite as high uh, because of the implant designs. Now we get in our time machine and we're gonna go a little bit further. And where are we gonna land? We're gonna land to about now, 2018, 2019, 2020, coronavirus time. Now at this point in time, we have pterygoid implants that are utilized for immediate loading. So in the late teens, 2000 teens, myself, uh, Dr. Nag, uh, Dr. Dietrich out of uh, Luxembourg, we were, beginning to publish articles, utilization of pterygoid implants for immediate loading. Now I can tell you in my practice, all of the pterygoid implants that we place are utilized for immediate load. I, I quite honestly don't think I've ever put in a pterygoid implant ever in my entire career 
that was not immediately loaded. Everyone is immediately loaded because as I'll show you in the lecture, if you are placing the pterygoid implant properly in the right position, you will engage hard bone. And if you're engaging hard bone, you will have very high torque and you will be able to immediately load it. If you are not achieving high torque values, then there's a very good chance that you are not uh, engaging the uh, proper location and you need to redirect your implant. So if you're placing these properly, you can utilize them for immediate load. So we have a number of different techniques. For example, my technique uh, described as the FAST protocol, the pterygoid fixated arch stabilization technique. Uh, Dr. Dieterich calls it the quarterly, cortically fixated at once protocol. Uh, Dr. Nag calls it the all tilt technique. Uh, so a number of different names for it, but we're all engaging the pterygoid maxillary complex. And I'll show you why we're utilizing this area and the benefits that it provides. So if we're gonna discuss full arch immediate loading, you know, this, pro, th this concept has been around for 20 plus years. You know, we know that it works. Dr. Malo, you know, uh, introduced this concept to us, you know, did his first cases, you know, in the 90s. The first publication was in 2003. And, you know, at this point in time, we have 20 years of data uh, plus on this. We know that the implant survival rate is very, very high. You know, higher, much, much higher than individual placed implants, you know, 98 plus percent. The prosthetic survival rate is very, very high, close to 100%. So if we have such a very, very high success rate with immediate loading of full arch cases, why do we even need pterygoid implants? We already have a very good success rate without them. So, you know, the, once you start doing a lot of these, and my practice is, is almost completely full arch immediate load. And as you do more and more full, you know, if you do just a couple of full arch immediate loads, one or two here and there, you know, you're, you're not going to see some of these more challenging cases. However, if you're doing a lot of immediate loads and you're doing them, you know, almost every single day, you're going to start seeing cases that present problems. You're going to have cases with soft bone. You're gonna have cases with no bone. You're going to have cases where things don't go exactly as planned, and you need a way to you know, save yourself, save the patient, rescue the case. And to be honest, that's how pterygoid implants became a part of my life. I didn't know how to do them in the past, and I had some cases that you know became problems for me, and I needed a solution. And you know, pterygoid implants became that solution for me for many of these cases, and. That's why I have incorporated them so heavily into my practice. And I'll tell you why we need them with full arch immediate load. So some of the reasons, we need them for additional support. They're going to increase our composite torque value. And I'll explain what that is. They're going to improve the AP spread, the anterior posterior spread for prosthetics. Now, I do all the surgery for my cases and I, I do have partners now that work with me and they do some of the surgeries and I do a lot of the surgeries still. But in the past, I did all of the surgeries and I did all of the restorations. So, uh, you know, many doctors, they do the surgeries, but they don't do the restorations. So they don't know some of the problems that can occur uh, because of their implant design setup. However, if you're doing all the restorations and you have to deal with the problems, then that really helps your surgery because you start to design your surgery to make sure that you have no prosthetic problems. And in the end, no one really cares about getting implants. They care about getting teeth. They care about getting uh, something that they could chew with. And you do something that you can have that's not going to cause problems. And so utilizing the pterygoid implants is going to help on the prosthetic end tremendously. And one of these uh, ways it helps is by improving the AP spread. It's also going to eliminate cantilevers, which is extremely important because I can tell you that after doing many thousands of these, that majority of the problems that I've ever had to deal with have always been due to cantilevers. So if I can live in a cantilevers, that really makes my life a lot easier. And pterygoid implants are really one of the only implants that you can truly say completely eliminate a cantilever. They can also be an alternative to a zygomatic implant. 
because while well, zygomatic implants are wonderful and I love doing them and you know, I've done a handful this week, not every single patient will uh, acquiesce to having a zygomatic implant. And a pterygoid implant is a, a very good alternative and can provide you with support when needed. It can also be utilized as a rescue implant. And so during certain cases, when you don't have support, and I've done this many, 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 many times, you can utilize this implant to save yourself, to save the restoration for the patient, uh, because it will provide you in most cases, not every single case, but in most cases, it will provide you with a very nice, dense, hard bone that you can anchor into and rescue your restoration, especially in some of these patients that have very, very soft bone. So let's look into this a little bit further. We're going to look into providing additional support, improving our AP spread and eliminating cantilevers. So we're gonna look at this case here. So we have this case and there's a number of failing restorations. The patient's taking a number of medications, has dry mouth, many, many crowns. This patient's obviously invested a lot of money, time into getting uh, dentistry done. However, because of the medications that she's taking, she has a, a recurrent decay on quite a few of these crowns. And so if we trace her sinuses, we can see that she has relatively large sinuses. They come all the way anterior to the canines. And so if we're doing a traditional all on four style treatment, we're gonna place our implants here, ideally, if we do everything perfectly. And we are going to get a restoration that may extend to about here. So, so at best, first molars. Now we can extend beyond the first molars, but then we're gonna have a really long cantilever and that's gonna possibly cause some problems. Not possibly, it's definitely gonna cause some problems. So this patient is used to having a full set of teeth. Now for some patients, only having first molars won't be a problem. However, many, many patients want a full set of teeth. And I can tell you that I've had a number of patients, they will ask, how many teeth do I get with my restoration? And you know, if you actually look at the literature, and there are some articles in the literature that report how many teeth are in a restoration, on average, the typical all on four style restoration will give you 12 teeth. However, there are patients and particular uh, ethnicities of patients that will ask very consistently, how many teeth am I going to get in my final restoration. And many patients will want 14 teeth because with their natural dentition, they had 14 teeth. So with this new dentition, they also want 14 teeth. So in some of these situations, a standard all on four style setup, in most cases is not going to give you 14 teeth. You will not be able to get second molars. Uh, so in this case, we can see that this at best is going to give us first molars at best. However, if we are able to incorporate pterygoid implants, as we did in this case, we eliminate the cantilever, we can now extend the restoration fully. And if we wanted to, we could even give this patient third molars. We don't ever do that, but we could if we wanted to. They're going to have a fully supported restoration, no cantilevers, and uh, have all the teeth. Now, the other thing that's important is in designing the smile. Some patients have very high smile lines, some patients have very wide smiles, and when they smile, you can see all the way back to their second molars. So in these patients, in your pre-surgical workup, that's one very important thing to look for is have the patient smile. And when we do a smile, we always do two types of smiles. We have them smile with a regular smile, and then we have them smile with a very exaggerated smile because I want to see how much their lip moves. Some people their lip can move very dramatically. And you can see all the way back, you know, it's like they're pulling the curtain back. I always call it a Julia Roberts smile where you can see everything. Now, if you are limiting your restoration to a first molar, then when they smile that big, you are going to see a, a black space back in the buccal corridor, back in that area, because where their second molar should be, there's not going to be any second molars. You don't have any 
teeth back there with a, a standard restoration. And you're going to notice that. And some patients, uh, I can tell you that when you put their teeth in, they almost forget how to smile. When you ask them how to, when you ask them to smile, they literally smile with all of their might. You could, you could see the tendons in their neck flexing. It's crazy, but it's almost every patient. They just smile so big because they're finally happy to have some teeth again. And if it's somebody that has a very mobile lip, you're going to see that area. And unless you're going to do a lip repositioning surgery, you know, that's going to cause you a problem. And pterygoid implants can eliminate that problem. So we look at this patient. This patient had a very high smile. And with her natural dentition, you could see a lot of uh, uh, gingiva. You could see she had almost a roller coaster dentition, uh, you know, very wavy, uh, showed all the way back as far as you can see. And with this, by the time we did the restoration uh, and the bone reduction, you know, we we're all the way up into the sinuses. And so we had to utilize the pterygoids to extend that restoration posteriorly. So when she smiles, it will extend all the way back and we will not see any dark spaces in the buccal corridor. So the other thing that a pterygoid implant can help prosthetically is eliminating the cantilever. And so why do we want to eliminate a cantilever? What's the problem with it? Well, we know there are multiple, multiple studies. You know, I have a few listed on the bottom, but there are many, many, many more. And we know that the pterygoid, uh, that the cantilevers caused increased stress on the terminal peri-implant bone. Uh, it's, it's acting as a lever. It's causing problems. Every time you chew on it, it's, it's creating uh, stress around that implant. The other thing that causes a problem, it causes screw loosening. And we see that quite a bit. When you have this excessively long cantilever, patients chew on it, it starts to cause the screw to loosen. Now your restoration starts to mobilize a little bit, and you can have a couple of problems. One, the screw can fracture, which is a complete pain to deal with. Two, the loosening of the screw can now cause other screws to loosen. And now you have your entire restoration becoming mobile. Uh, the, now you would think that patients paying a lot of money for the surgery, that if they have any movement in the restoration, they're gonna call you about it. And I could tell you that in many cases, these patients will not call you. Uh, we have had patients that, you know, a restoration becomes loose and then it will be loose for six months, nine months, some even a year. And then they finally call you and they call you because now they're having pain. They're having a problem. And, you know, one patient in particular, her restoration was loose for almost an entire year before she finally called us. And then when she did call us, all of the implants had failed because for an entire year, this restoration is just loose, it's moving, and now everything has failed. And now you have to start completely over. And, you know, my, my partner dealt with this case, you know, so you had to remove all the implants, graft everything, put all new, you know, bone in, weight, let the implants heal. It was a complete pain. And why? Because the patient had a loose screw that ended up causing all of the other screws to loosen, ended up causing the implants to fail. And more than likely, it was caused because of a cantilever. And if we can eliminate a cantilever, it will help eliminate this. Screw fractures are a complete pain to deal with because in many cases, you can not get the screw out of the abutment. And if you can't get the screw out of the abutment, you have to replace the abutment, which is adds chair time. It adds uh, time to your schedule. It's just, you know, the things if you don't have to deal with, it, it's, it's uh, good for the office. So another thing that pterygoid implants can help improve is composite torque value. So what is composite torque value, CTV? So composite torque value is essentially when you're inserting your implant and your insertion torque of your implant, you're going to add up all of the uh, values. Uh, of your implants that you're placing into the bone. And once you add those up, once you meet a minimum number, which we'll discuss in a minute, then you do, you have a pretty good chance of having a good implant survival, a prosthetic survival. So we're gonna look at this case. This particular case, uh, this patient is 80 plus years old. You can see he's had a handful of implants. 
He's lost his posterior dentition. Now he comes to see us because, as you can see, he's got a number of root canal treated teeth, a number of short roots. He also has a few implants in the anterior. Uh, but if you're able to see the CBCT on this, those implants, the bone up there is very, very thin. And the facial aspect of these implants is, you know, they're sticking through the bone in many cases. Uh, so there's not a whole lot of bone up there. And so we gave this patient option of zygomatic implants and in, because of his age, he declined to have them. And so we had to come up with an alternative. And so for this particular patient, we look at where his sinuses are and they've pneumatized because uh, you know he's been missing his posterior dentition over time. And the other thing to mention is this patient's also a lawyer, which is always great, you know, working on lawyers, you know, not to add, you know, challenge to the case, you know, they're hard enough to begin with, but now you're working on a lawyer, which makes it even more difficult. Um, so we know he has big pneumatized sinuses. And so for this particular patient, what we did was two sinus grafts. And we couldn't place anything in the anterior because the bone was just, it was just too thin. Now this patient didn't want any zygomatic implants. So I apologize for my dog barking. You know, we're coronavirus times and doing these webinars and you know, my dog barks at any fly that comes across the room. Um, but in this case, we did two large sinus grafts and we're placing implants into that sinus bone, but that's regenerated bone. And you know, at best, you see we have very good lifts, very high uh, amount of bone growth, but at best we're getting about type three bone. You know, so it's not very dense bone. So as we're placing these implants in order to increase our composite torque value, we add some pterygoid implants. And by placing these pterygoid implants, we're gauging very dense, hard type one bone and is increasing our CTV which is also going to uh, eliminate cantilevers. Uh, so it's going to do nothing but benefits for us in terms of placing this restoration. So what is CTV? What's the magic number on this? So uh, Jensen, Oli Jensen was the uh, one that coined this term. And typically in most of his articles, he's referencing 120 Newton centimeters of uh, composite torque value. So if you're adding up all of your insertion torque for all of your implants, if you can come up with 120 Newton centimeters, then we know that you have a very good chance of having a successful outcome. So in the past, before, uh, before we were doing pterygoid implants in the office, before we were doing zygomatic implants in the office, if we had cases that had very soft bone, um, uh, inadequate bone, uh, if we did not have very good insertion torque value, then how we dealt with it at that point in time was to just place additional implants because we were trying to increase this composite torque value. So the more implants we have, the more bone to implant contact we have, uh, the, uh, the, the, the closer we can get to this 120 Newton centimeter torque value. And now with pterygoid implants, with zygomatic implants, we can very easily, very, very quickly reach this 120 Newton centimeter torque value because this bone is so hard, so very, very dense. And you know, many times I'll see some older cases that come through and I say, oh, you know, if I could go back in a time machine, my, get back in my DeLorean and go back, you know, I could definitely treat this differently. You know, instead of placing a whole bunch of implants to get my CTV up, I would just place a couple of pterygoid implants, no problem. I wouldn't have to have all these extra implants in there. But that is what we're going for, is trying to get 120 CTVs if we can. So in 2018, I published an article uh, in uh, JACD, which uh, uh, in this particular article, we placed 25 cases. And uh, these were all immediately loaded. And the average insertion torque for these cases for the pterygoid implants was close to 45 Newton centimeters of torque. So if we look at these and we're placing bilateral pterygoid implants, just those two implants are gonna get us close to 75% of our uh, composite torque value, just with those two implants. So now we're gonna place our anterior implants and we're very easily gonna reach the remainder 
of our 120 uh, newton centimeters of composite torque value. And I can tell you that if you're if you're placing the turgoid implants in the proper dimension and the proper angulation, you will typically get much higher than 45 newton centimeters of torque. And this will get you to your CTV very quickly. So another great indication for a pterygoid implant is a rescue implant. And this has saved my butt a number of times. So I'm gonna show you a couple of cases on this. So if we look at this particular case, we can see that the patient has uh, sinuses that come pretty far anteriorly. Anytime I see a sinus that comes beyond the canines, you know, that gets me thinking to alternatives. Uh, it gets me thinking to pterygoids. It gets me thinking to zygomas. Because, you know, with the typical case, we're sinuses extending to premolar area. When it starts extending to canines or even anterior to the canines, then we know that's limiting our bone uh, that we have to engage with our implants for an all-on four style surgery. Because you got to remember, when we're taking these teeth out, we're going to be reducing this bone, or you should be reducing bone. Now, I can tell you, a lot of people that are doing these procedures, they are not reducing bone, and it causes a lot of problems. And in our office, you know, my partner Juan Gonzalez and I, we see a lot of cases that we have to fix that other offices do because they uh, are not following some of the proper protocols. You know, it's very easy to put four implants into bone and to attach teeth to them. But again, no one cares about getting the implants. They care about getting the teeth. And if you're not designing these properly, they can cause a lot of problems. And so when we see these sinuses that are very big, very pneumatized, uh, very anterior, you know, by the time you reduce bone, that really limits the uh, amount of available bone you have for engagement of implants. And so with this case, uh, we can see that on the right side in particular, that this sinus is very anterior, so you know, it's beyond the canine, almost to the lateral. And so in this case, I did a trans sinus implant. So I went you know, through the sinus, engage the piriform rim. And uh, unfortunately, that implant failed. So, you know, when you're doing these cases, and, you know, if you do one or two a month, or, you know, four or five a year, you're probably not going to run into very many problems. But if you're doing them a lot, you know, all the time, you know, almost every day, you're going to run into problems. It's inevitable. And, and the question is, how do you deal with those problems? Can you deal with them or do you have to send them to someone else to fix? And so in this case, with this implant failing, we we'll look at what we have left. And we could see that if we were to take this failed implant out, then what are our options at that point in time? we can do a sinus graft and we have to let that sinus graft heal for four to six months. And what do we do during that time? Well, we obviously can't keep the patient in the same restoration because you're going to have an excessively long cantilever and that cantilever is gonna break and that patient's gonna be coming back to your office all the time with breaks on their temporary restoration. They're not gonna be happy. Your assistants are not gonna be happy. You're not going to be happy because you have to deal with this all the time. So that's not a great option. So in order to eliminate that, you'd have to cut the temporary restoration. Well, that's not going to make the patient very happy because now their temporary restoration ends at, say, the canine. So when they smile, you're going to see a big gap behind the canine. So you know, that's a problem. So how do we deal with that? So what we did in this particular case was we place a pterygoid. We place a pterygoid implant on the right side. And now we take out the failed implant. We graft that site. We can extend back to the pterygoid implant because we placed a very long pterygoid implant. And now in that transitional restoration, we just extend it to attach to the pterygoid. So now the patient does not have to go with a short restoration. The patient does not have to avoid smiling 
because you're going to see a big gap in that area. And to balance the restoration out, we also went ahead and placed a pterygoid implant on the other side. So now anytime we're doing a pterygoid rescue implant, we'll always give the patient the option and say, hey, we're gonna place a, you know, we need to place a extra implant on this side. You know, do you want us to place one on the other side to balance the restoration? And I'd say about 70, 30, you know, 70% of patients will say, yes, go ahead and place another one on the other side. And about 30% of the patients will say, no, you know, I don't want to go through the extra surgery. I don't want to, you know, have you work on that side. Just place the one on the side that you need it. And, you know, don't worry about going to the other area. And uh, now in the time of surgery, initial surgery, if you, you know, obviously have the patient sedated for this procedure, you know, during the uh, consultation and the consent, we tell the patients, hey, look, we're going to put in whatever we need to put in. And we charge just one fee at the office. So if we put in extra implants, they don't get charged an extra fee. Because our goal is we want the restorations to work and last as long as possible. And the fewer complications and the fewer problems you have to deal with, the better for you and the better for the patient. And so if we need to place extra implants, then we just place extra implants. Now, if something fails afterwards, then you can get into the situation where you need to place additional rescue implants. And that's where we'll ask the patient, do they want one or two? And again, we don't charge them for any of that. So if we look at this particular case, by placing a pterygoid rescue implant, we only had to do one additional surgery, a little bit of additional healing time. They're able to keep their transitional teeth with very minimal modifications. And when they smiled, they were able to see all of their teeth without any changes. And then as an added benefit, we were able to eliminate the cantilever. Now, if we did a non-pterygoid rescue, if the patient didn't want a pterygoid implant, then we would have had to do multiple additional surgeries. We would have had to do a sinus graft. And I could tell you in this particular case, he had an oral enteral fistula. I had to close the oral enteral fistula. So I would have had to close the you know, OA fistula. I would have had to wait, let that heal, then come back and do the sinus lift and then let that heal and then come back and do the implants and then let that heal. So you're looking at probably an extra year of healing time where we didn't have to do that in this case, we take the bad implant out, we close the OA fistula, we place the pterygoid implant all at the same time. So three months of time versus 12 months of time for this particular case. Uh, we would also, if we did not place the pterygoid implant, we would have had to cut his bridge to avoid having an excessively long cantilever. So that was also good because that's aesthetically better for the patient, functionally better for the patient. And uh, that keeps our patient happier than if we would have had to shorten the restoration. And even at the end, even if we have done sinus lifts and a year of extra treatment, he was still would have had a little bit of a cantilever. By doing the pterygoid implant, no cantilever, all that's eliminated. So if we're placing pterygoid implants, we need to know anatomy. So pterygoid implants, many, many, many practitioners have referred to this as the most difficult implant, even harder than zygomatic implants. And why is that? Well, because this is essentially a blind procedure. You can't see what you're doing. And because you can't see what you're doing, you have to know the anatomy very, very well because there are certain things in the proximity of the uh, pterygomaxillary complex that you don't want to hit. And you can't take an x-ray while you're doing these implants. So the only way that you can do this is by knowing the anatomy, by knowing the angulations that you're going to place this implant. So if we're talking about the pterygomaxillary comp bony complex, you know, what is that? It's essentially made up of the maxillary tuberosity, the pyramidal process of the palatine bone, and the pterygoid process of the sphenoid bone. So if we're talking about tuberosity, Everyone's very familiar with maxillary tuberosities. We know, especially in edentulous patients, it can be uh, very uh, fatty bone, very soft bone. You know, number of studies in literature have shown us that this is type four bone, low density, 
increased marrow spaces, a lot of adipose tissue in this area. Uh, maxillary sinuses, we know when we take out the posterior teeth, we have pneumatization, expansion of the maxillary sinus. And that also reduces the amount of available bone in the posterior maxilla. And, you know, sometimes this bone is so soft that, you know, you can literally take a surgical suction and just suction away the bone. You don't even have to scrape it away with a curette. It's just so soft. So, you know, it, it'd be even type 12 bone. You know, it's just so soft that there's just nothing there. It's like melted butter almost. Now, the sphenoid bone, you know, this is very dense, hard bone. This is uh, encompassing our pterygoid processes, the medial pterygoid process, lateral pterygoid process. This is abutting the sphenoid bone to the palatine bone. Very hard, strong bone. Now the palatine bone, the palatine bone, what we're utilizing for pterygoid implants in particular is the pyramidal process. Now the pyramidal process is very dense, hard type one bone, very strong. This bone, a uh, number of studies have been done and it's up to 140%, 139% denser than the bone that we find in the maxillary tuberosity. So very, very strong bone if we can engage it. Now the average thickness is this from an anterior posterior direction is about six and a half millimeters. From medial lateral direction, about nine and a half millimeters. And if we're looking at the height of this, it's about 13 millimeters. So this is very good, strong island of bone, very, very hard bone in a sea of very soft tuberosity bone. And if we can engage it, then we can get you know, a very good, uh, strong insertion torque for our implants. But the problem is it's blind. So we have to be able to do this almost having your eyes closed. And you can literally do this procedure with your eyes closed. You don't have to see where you're going. You don't have to take any x-rays. But in order to do this, you have to know the anatomy. You have to know the angulations where you're going and what anatomical structures that you want to engage. So we're trying to engage the pyramidal process of the palatine bone. That's going to be the first part that you're going to engage. And then beyond that, you're going to engage the pterygoid processes of the sphenoid bone. So if we look at this, this is a radiograph that we took from one of our patients, our cone beam. And if you look at the gray values, you can see on the left, the maxillary tuberosity. And we have about 1141 gray values. And just, just looking at it, you can see, you know, it, it's much, much more radiolucent. And then you go up to the pterygomaxillary complex, pterygomaxillary pillar here. You can see we have 1531 gray values. So much more dense. And you can see just by looking at it, it's much more radio-opaque. You, you can see that it's a much harder bone. And that's that bone that we want to gauge with our pterygoid implant. And once you do that, then you can increase your CTV. You can immediately load these because you know that you have uh, much stronger support with these implants. Now, this is very important because there are a lot of bad things anatomically that we want to avoid in this area. So if we look at some vital structures in the pterygomaxillary area, you know, one is the pterygoid venous plexus. The pterygoid venous plexus, this is a valve-free venous plexus. It's located in the infratemporal fossa. It is contiguous with the cavernous sinuses. It uh, drains into the maxillary vein. And this has excessive hemorrhage potential. We do not want to hit this. Now, the only way you're going to hit this in the average situation, because of course, you know, we're human beings. With human beings, you can have a barren anatomy. But for the average person, if you're going to hit the pterygoid venous plexus, then you went way too far laterally because this uh, anatomical structure is lateral to where we're aiming to. And if we hit it, it can cause significant hemorrhaging. And there are a handful of reports in the literature and most of these are in medical literature, ENT literature, uh, for tumor removal, resection, where 
they've done comparisons of procedures where the turgoid venous plexus was damaged versus not damaged. And in some of these cases, some of the patients lost eight liters of blood if the pterygoid venous plexus was damaged during the surgical procedure uh, versus not being damaged during the surgical procedure. So we definitely want to avoid damaging this area at all costs. And again, in order to hit this, you really have to be much more lateral than where we intend to be. Now the maxillary artery. Maxillary artery is another uh, structure in proximity to replacing our pterygoid implants. Now, it has a very long uh, uh, extension and it courses through the pterygoid venous uh, plexus into uh, some other adjacent fossa in the area. And with this, we want to avoid extending too far laterally because we can damage this if we're hitting uh, this by extending you know, into the pterygoid venous plexus. However, this also extends into the tax, uh, pterygoid maxillary uh, uh, fissure. This is connecting the infratemporal fossa to the pterygopalatine fossa. It's a conduit for the maxillary artery. It's also a conduit for the posterior superior alveolar nerve. And there are a number of uh, studies published uh, in oral surgery literature and anatomical general science literature where measurements have been done. And the average distance from the dentulous maxillary tuberosity to the pterygoid maxillary fissure is about 18.7 millimeters. Uh, now measuring that same distance all the way up to the, uh, to the maxillary artery, can be up to 25 millimeters. Uh, it's a very classic uh, oral surgery uh, article by Fonseca um, that our oral surgery colleagues utilize for Lafort surgery quite a bit because they're back in this area a lot for doing Lafort surgery. And uh, no, uh, knowing these measurements and these uh, angulations and this anatomy is very important so we can avoid damaging these uh, vital structures. So the pterygopalatine fossa, this is a cone-shaped fossa. Now, in this fossa, there are eight different foramina. Now, in particular, things that we want to avoid in this area are the third branches of the maxillary artery, because this gives off multiple other branches. And what's in particular, of concern to us for placing a pterygoid implant is the main body of the third branch of the maxillary artery and the descending palatine artery. These are uh, really, if we're utilizing the correct length of implant and the correct angulation, the ones that we need to be concerned about. Uh, all the other branches, if you're hitting those, you're really doing something really, really wrong. You're really off angle, you're using something way too long. Uh, so in terms of the descending palatine artery, uh, we're talking about the greater palatine canal, the greater palatine foramen, and this is connecting the pterygoid palatine fossa to the oral cavity. And this is where you have the descending palatine artery. And this foramen, uh, it has multiple different exit points. And in about 16% of cases, it's exiting opposite of the second molar. In some cases, it's between the second and third molar. In the majority of cases, it's located at about the third molar. And in a very small percentage of cases, it's distal to the third molar. Now I'll show you where we're gonna angulate and aim our pterygoid implant. It's not really gonna be close to any of these areas. So if you're going to hit the greater palatine canal, with the descending palatine artery, you're really off angle. Uh, likewise, if you're going to hit the pterygoid venous plexus, then you're really gonna be off angle. So by knowing this anatomy, by knowing where you need to angulate your implant, it can be a relatively uh, safe procedure, but you need to really know your anatomy. So let's talk about the insertion technique. You know, How do you do this? So we have a case here and if we 
analyze our angulation from the anterior posterior direction relative to the Frankfurt horizontal plane. Now, once you read enough literature, you'll see that there's two camps. One camp, the articles have a about a 70 degree angulation anterior posteriorly. Number of articles report this anywhere from 69 degrees to 75 degrees. However, there are a number of other articles that are reporting angulations of about 45 degrees. So why do we have this big divide? You know, some articles reporting 70 degrees, some articles reporting 45 degrees. Well, it all depends on your insertion point. So the more anterior that you're inserting your implant, the flatter your ankle is going to be. The most posterior that you're inserting your implant, the steeper your insertion angle is going to be. So 45 degrees versus 70 degrees. If you're inserting at about the second molar, you're going to have closer to 45 degrees. If you're, in close, if you're inserting closer to the third molar, you're gonna have closer to 70 degrees. So why are you gonna have one insertion point versus the other? Well, that's all going to be determined by the anatomy in the area. The amount of sinus pneumatization, the amount of tuberosity, you know, residual subantral bone that you have. In some cases, you have more pneumatized sinus and you can, you're going to have to insert more posteriorly and you're gonna have a steeper angle, closer to 70 degrees. In some cases, you're going to have a larger tuberosity, less pneumatized sinus. You can insert it at the second molar you're gonna have a flatter angle, more closer to 45 degrees. Now, you can also insert your pterygoid implant and go through the sinus and still get your 45 degrees. So every case is not going to be the exact same. It's going to be dictated by anatomy. And so one question that uh, many doctors will ask is, you know, do I need to have a cone beam in, you know, to do this? Do I need a CAT scan? You know, I know in many parts of the world, in many pay, uh, many doctors' offices, they they do not have a cone beam. Uh, while it's ideal if you do have one and definitely beneficial, I would say that it is possible to do this procedure without a cone beam, because again, once you know the anatomy, once you know all the angulations, once you know uh, the vital structures that you want to avoid, I think that you could still safely place this implant without a cone beam, but definitely if you had a cone beam versus a traditional uh, uh, just radiograph, whether it be digital or non-digital, I mean, the cone beam is going to win hand down every time. CAT scan is going to win hands down. Um, but uh, that's why your angulations are going to be different 45 versus 70. And a medial lateral angulations. There's only a handful of articles in literature that have reported medial lateral insertion angulations. Uh, typically, these are going to be 75 to 80 degrees. And that all depends on how you measure it. So if you measure it in one direction, it's going to be 75 to 80 degrees relative to a 90 degree angulation. If you measure it from the opposite angle, it's going to be 5 to 15 degrees. Um, and so in this case, you can see that, you know, we're at 66 degrees and you can see that we're completely engaged in the pterygomaxillary pillar, a uh, very strong, dense bone. And so these are going to be anatomically dictated. And this is where, if you have a CAT scan, you can measure these angulations because most, uh, most cone beam programs have angulation uh, measurement tools to where you can pre-evaluate this and have a better idea of how you're going to need to angulate your implants in a anterior posterior direction, in a medial lateral direction to engage this dense bone uh, relative to the maxillary tuberosity. Uh, so I can tell you in some cases, you know, we have them angulated medial laterally uh, as much as 45 degrees. Uh, in some cases, five degrees. And it's going to be different because people come in all different shapes and sizes. So again, depending on where you're measuring things, if you're measuring it from one area, you're going to have a 75 to 85 degree angulation. If you're measuring it from another 
uh, another angulation, you're going to have 5 to 15. And that's why sometimes in the literature you'll see two different reports. But there's not very many articles that have reported on the mediolateral insertion angle. Most of them tend to report the anterior posterior insertion angle. Okay, now how big of an implant do we need to place in these areas? Do you need a small implant, a big implant? So I can tell you that in the literature, most literature reports that you need at least to technically be considered a pterygoid implant, anywhere from at least a 13 to 15 millimeter implant. Because if you're going anything shorter than that, you're more than likely just en uh, engaging tuberosity bone. Uh, and personally, if you're using anything shorter than a 15 millimeter, 16 millimeter implant, you're probably more than likely engaging just tuberosity bone. You're not actually engaging the uh, pyramidal process, the, the uh, pterygoid processes of the sphenoid bone, uh, pterygoid maxillary pillar. So in the literature, typically diameter wise, we see 3.5 millimeters to 4.3 millimeters. And you got to remember that the average thickness of the pyramidal process is about 6 to 6.7 millimeters. And so by utilizing a 3.5 to a 4.3 millimeter, we know that we have adequate bone uh, circumferentially around the implant. Now, lengthwise, how long of an implant are we using? In the literature, there's a huge range, all the way from 8.5 millimeters to even 25 millimeters. Um, on average, the typical ones that we see in the literature, again, 13 millimeters to 18 millimeters. And if we look at our anatomical studies, remember that the average distance from the maxillary tuberosity to the pterygoid maxillary fissure is about 18.7 millimeters. Now where the uh, maxillary artery comes in, that's typically going to be you know, a few millimeters higher than that. So we know that by utilizing an implant of that length, we still are gonna be safe in most instances. So the insertion technique, now how do you do this? So there are a number of different ways when you talk to people that do pterygoid implants, how they do this. And my technique, uh, my partner's technique has changed over time. And what we'll do is because we're going to engage that soft bone of the maxillary tuberosity first, in many cases, you can just push through that bone. You don't even have to drill. The bone's so soft that you just can push through it. And so we utilize either a sharp osteotome. Uh, in Norris Medical makes a uh, pterygoid osteotome that has a, a sharp point. And many times you can just push that osteotome through that bone. Or you can use a sharp spade drill. Uh, in your implant handpiece and just essentially push it through that very soft tuberosity bone. And you're pushing it through that bone and you're looking to engage the pterygoid maxillary complex, the pyramidal process, the pterygoid maxillary pillar. And that's a very dense, hard type one bone. So you're gonna go through the tuberosity, which is a soft bone and you're pushing your osteotome or your spade drill through that, and then you'll hit a very hard bone, and then you know you're in the right spot. But how do you hit that? That's where you're utilizing your angulation measurements. That's where you know, uh, your knowledge of anatomy comes into play. So by angulating 70 or 45 degrees, depending on where you're inserting, if you're at the first, uh, second molar, versus the third molar. You wanna insert set 45 to 70 degrees anterior posteriorly. And then you wanna also have your palatal insertion angle anywhere from 75 to 80 degrees from a medial lateral insertion angle. And that one I'd say is the most important because if you look at the literature, the handful of articles that describe failed pterygoid implants, they almost universally describe failed implants because the implants were too lateral. The palatal insertion angle was too shallow. When you're too shallow, you essentially bounce off the side of the pterygoid maxillary complex and you're not engaging the type one dense hard bone that you need to engage. 
And then once you do this, you are engaging that hard bone and then you can drill into that bone. And then uh, Norris makes a second osteotome that's a little bit wider and a blunt end. And you can tap that and that's going to do some uh, bone condensation. It's going to expand your osteotomy. And then if you want, you can even utilize your next drill in the sequence. And typically when we do this, I won't undersize the prep too much because that bone is very dense. And you know, in some cases, if you under prep it too much, I have seen some cases where you can fracture that bone because you generate such high amounts of torque in that area. Uh, so you definitely want to uh, uh, you have a, a, a proper size osteotomy for the size implant that you're placing, whether it be a 3.5, all the way up to you know 4.2, 4.3 millimeters. So we can see in this CBCT, we have about a 70 uh, degree uh, distal insertion angle, and then medial lateral or paddle insertion angle, we can see that it measures close to 80 degrees. So again, many people consider the pterygoid implant to be the most difficult implant or a very difficult implant because it is a blind insertion technique. You cannot take radiographs while you're placing this implant like you do with, say, a standard implant. Also, uh, in comparison to a zygomatic implant, well, the zygomatic implant, you can uh, see the tip of the drill perforate the zygoma. You, you, you can feel it or you can visualize it. With this, you can't see it. And so that's what makes this technique a bit more challenging. So while we're doing this by feel, we know that you should go through soft bone and then it should feel like you're hitting a, a wall, something very, very hard. And this is one of the only implant insertion techniques where you also can utilize your ears. And your ears can be very important because if you're utilizing the osteotome, you can you know, auditorially listen to the difference in the sound from when you're tapping the osteotome through the very soft type four bone of the tuberosity to the very dense type one bone of the pterygoid maxillary complex, you'll hear a difference in the sound and you'll also feel a difference tactily. And so you get two ways to determine if you're at the right spot. And so if you're placing your osteotome or your sharp spade drill and you don't hear that change in uh, frequency. You don't feel that difference in the way uh, that it engages the bone, then more than likely you're too lateral. And what you need to do is you need to re-angulate your drill, typically more medially, to engage that denser bone. And it's almost always more medially. You're just, in most cases, you're always too lateral if you're not getting that dense, hard feeling. Now, there are some patients, their measurements of the pterygoid maxillary complex are, are, are fairly minimal. And you can see that on the cone beam. And, and those patients, you, know, you may just not be able to engage that dense bone. And I can tell you, even though I have many, many, many pterygoid implants, I cannot hit it every single time. There are some cases where, uh, we're just not able to hit it because some uh, pterygoid maxillary complexes are smaller and some pterygoid maxillary complexes are bigger. And with this procedure in particular, compared to many other types of implant procedures, you, in many cases, you get one shot at this. You get one chance to do your osteotomy prep. And if you're in the wrong spot, if you're at the wrong angulation, then you don't get a second chance. Now, because I've done many, many of these, in some cases, I'm able to re-angle uh, re my drill and engage the denser bone of the pterygoid maxillary complex. But even though I've done a lot of these, in some cases, if I don't have that dense feeling 
even when I'm reangulating the drill, I still can't get it. Uh, so with this, you know, really your first shot, your first osteotomy is the most important when you're placing these implants. So if we place this correctly, we know that we can engage up to eight plus millimeters of dense cortical bone at the tergo maxillary complex. Insertion torque. So what can we expect to get? So there's only a handful of articles that have reported on insertion torque with pterygoid implants. And if you are actually engaging the pterygoid maxillary complex, then typically you're going to get anywhere from uh, typically 45 plus Newton centimeters of torque. Usually it's a, it's a very, very dense, very, very strong insertion torque. So let's look at some data for pterygoid implant survival. If we look at some of the older studies, the survival rate was not quite as high. You know, and again, that's because the type of implants that were used, they were machine surface. They were non-cutting, uh, non-end cutting implants. And then as we get to some later studies, we can see that the survival rates start to go up much higher, much more close to what we see with standard implants. And this is good because it shows us that even though we're utilizing this bone that's a, a blind insertion technique, where you're going from type four bone to type one bone, that we have implant survival rates that are very comparable to other standard implants. Now, if you remember, many of these older studies are delayed load protocols. Now, if we look at some of the newer studies or more recent studies with immediately loaded protocols, uh, the success rates on those, the survival rates on those, uh, tend to be even a little bit higher, uh, a little bit higher than we have for delayed load protocols. Because when we're immediately loading these, we're typically utilizing a cross arch stabilization technique, which there are many, many, many studies that show us that if we have a splinted uh, implant design, that if we have a cross arch stabilization design, that's that going to give us a higher implant survival rate versus a freestanding uh, delayed load protocol. Now, recently in 2019, uh, Arajo did a uh, systematic review, meta-analysis, looked at a number of pterygoid implant studies uh, over the years and found about 95% implant survival rate for pterygoid implants. Now, this systematic review and meta-analysis had a pretty strict inclusion criteria. And many of the studies that were considered for this uh, meta-analysis and systematic review were excluded because of the reporting of the data or many of the studies, what they were calling pterygoid implants, as we discussed a little bit earlier, uh, were not actually engaging the pterygoid maxillary complex. They were really tuberosity implants. They were not pterygoid implants. Uh, so the handful of studies that did qualify uh, for inclusion in this systematic review and meta-analysis, uh, I think there, if I remember correctly, there was about six studies, uh, had about a 95% uh, survival rate. Now, most of the uh, implants in this review were delayed low protocol. And if you look at the more recent studies uh, by myself, by NAG, by Dieterich, uh, that are immediate load protocols, we tend to have a little bit higher survival rates, you know, 96%, 97%, 98% compared to uh, the delayed load protocols. So failures. So if we examine pterygoid implant failures in the literature, now again, because most of the studies that have been published are delayed load protocols, they show that most of the failures occur before implant loading. And there are very few immediate load cases that are documented in the literature. And you know, there's a handful that I mentioned before, but in the articles that have analyzed pterygoid implant failures, almost universally, they find that the reason for the failure is because the implant was placed too lateral that it was not actually engaging the pterygoid maxillary complex. The angle needed to be uh, a bit steeper 
from medial lateral angulation. And we can see in this particular uh, radiograph here, or this uh, cone beam scan, that our angulation is just a bit too shallow. And we can see that the implant is just slightly engaging just a little bit of the pterygomaxillary complex with the uh, inner portions of the threads. And so if we were able to use a little bit longer implant, if we were able to angulate it a bit more medially, that we would have engaged that much harder, denser bone of the pterygomaxillary complex. And so most of the studies, when we have failures of these, it's because of improper uh, or inadequate insertion angulations of the pterygoid implants. So let's look at bone loss over time. Uh, a handful of articles that examine bone loss with pterygoid implants. And what we find is that the bone loss with these over time is very comparable to conventional dental implants. So we know that these, once they are, are healed, that they remain very stable over time. So complications. So what complications can we have with these implants? A typical complication that we're going to see, and that's what's reported in the literature, is hemorrhaging. Because we know we have a number of vital structures nearby. And I can tell you that in the literature, there aren't any uh, reports of any significant amounts of hemorrhaging. Most of the hemorrhaging reported in the literature has been controlled by just inserting the implant. Once you insert the implant, the hemorrhaging stays under control. Now, just in personal communications with many colleagues that I have in placing pterygoid implants, uh, you know, I have had discussions of where there were excessive amounts of hemorrhaging, and most of these were controlled by just uh, packing with gauze and waiting. Uh, so I don't know of any significant hemorrhage complications, although we know that because of the uh, anatomical structures that are close by, there's definitely potential for that. There are a number of reports in the literature of trismus after pterygoid implant insertions. And I myself have had a couple instances of this. However, most of these uh, are controlled uh, or go away with just time. Typically within four to six weeks, the trismus goes away, whether you're using uh, uh, non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatories, uh, using uh, warm, moist heat. Typically, the, the trismus goes away in the same type of treatment that you would do for minor uh, temporal mandibular uh, treatment, uh, disorder treatment. There are some reports in the literature of displacement of pterygoid implants into adjacent fossa and also into the sinuses. And what's interesting in a few cases that have been reported in literature, uh, they were guided cases. And so sometimes I think when people are doing guided implant surgery, they have this false sense of security that because everything was designed by computer and they have a guide that you know, everything's going to go perfectly according to plan. And, you know, there are studies in literature that show, you know, with your guide, you can be a few angle, uh, a few degrees angle off. And if you're using a zygomatic implant because of the length of the implant, you know, being a couple degrees off, that can cause, you know, quite a bit of uh, discrepancy uh, from the apex versus the insertion point because it's such a long length. And, when you have all this uh, vital anatomy close by, that could cause a problem. And so, for example, in the literature, some of the cases where the implants were displaced in infratemporal fossa, uh, they were guided cases. And in one of the cases reported, the patient happened to bite down and bit onto the guide and shoved the implant into the fossa. And in one of the cases, they were able to retrieve it during the surgery. And in other cases, they had to uh, close up the case and send the patient to interventional radiology to have the implant removed because it was up near the foramen uh, ovale. And the uh, 
you know, so this is something that you want to be very careful of. And I have seen personally in watching people place these implants where they're off angle a little bit and you can see the implant ready to fall into a fossa. Uh, so when you're placing this, you should feel a very dense, hard bone. And if you're not feeling that and it's very soft, then you need to be very careful because you don't want to lose this implant. Uh, if it goes into a fossa, that's going to be a complete pain to go deal with. If it falls into the sinus, you know, that's quite a bit easier to retrieve. You just open up the sinus, go in and fish it out. And, you know, personally, uh, you know, I'll say that I've had to do that myself. And you, you just open up the sinus, you go get the implant out, you re-angle it, you find the turcomaxillary complex, you engage it, you're fine, you patch up the sinus, it's usually not a problem. But going into a fossa, that would, you know, make a day not be very fun. Other complications uh, or contraindications to this, if you look in the literature, uh, very, very few absolute contraindications for this procedure uh, for pterygoid implants. One that is mentioned repeatedly is limited mouth opening. And because of this, uh, you have to go in the you know, very back of the mouth to place these implants. And if somebody can't open very wide, it's very difficult to get your instruments back there. Also, in terms of the restoration, if they can't open very wide, um, when the patient is closing, there's going to be a chance that they're going to hit the pterygoid area of the restoration on the opposing dentition. And if they do that, then they will end up with an open bite in the anterior. And if you can't reduce the bite enough in the posterior, then you won't be able to utilize your pterygoid implant. Even though it's there and it's engaged in the bone, if it's not good prosthetically, then it's useless. And so you can see in this particular patient, you can see our angulation from medial lateral direction and an anterior posterior direction. Uh, that's just the osteotome. But then after we do this, then we have to place the implants. We're going to have a, you know, a 20, you know, 18 to 20 millimeter implant attached to an implant handpiece that we have to place in the mouth. Then we have to put a wrench in there to tighten with a torque wrench. And then eventually we're going to have to put a prosthetic in there with a prosthetic screw. And so if the mouth opening is very limited, it's going to make it very difficult for you uh, as the restoring dentist. And if you're the surgeon doing this, and you're not doing the prosthetics, then you always have to remember your prosthetic colleagues because the easier you can make life for them, the happier they're going to be. Uh, another relative comp indication for placing pterygoid implants is impacted third molars and uh, you know, maxillary impacted third molars. And I can tell you before, you know, I started placing a lot of pterygoid implants. If I saw an impacted maxillary third molar, I really didn't pay it much attention because yeah, you know, we're going to place our implants in a standard all in four type fashion, and we really weren't going to deal with that area. However, if we're doing pterygoid implants and we have an impacted third molar, then that's going to reduce the amount of available bone right in the area that we want to place the pterygoid implant. And by the time you go in there, you remove the impacted third molar, it can make it very difficult to place a pterygoid implant in that area. So now that we've covered, you know, a, a brief description of the history and the anatomy and the indications, constant indications for these types of implants, so I'm going to show you one last case because uh, now we have, you know, just a limited amount of time to go over all of this. And in this particular case, so this patient had actually come to see us originally in our office and we presented him with a treatment plan and then he disappeared for a couple of years. And what we ended up finding was that he ended up going to another office in town that was a low cost denture center type of office. And they ended up moving his teeth and placing implants. And over about an 18 month period of time, the number of implants they placed kept changing because they placed some implants, they would fail, they remove them, they place other implants. And as you can see, this patient does not have any restoration because they were not able to immediately load these. He just had dentures. And I can tell you that he was never able to wear the dentures. Uh, they just did not fit very well. 
uh, you can see that there's an impacted uh, mandibular third molar left. There's also a piece of impacted maxillary third molar that was left up in the sinus. And so we ended up taking this case and changing it from this to this. So we placed a couple of zygomatic implants. We placed a piriform rim implant, a vomer implant, and a pterygoid implant. In the mandible, we ended up placing a couple of long implants that were engaging the inferior uh, cortical bone of the mandible. And we had to do this because one of the reasons that there were so many implant failures in this case was his bone was just very, very soft. It was a very, you know, type four bone just everywhere. And you can see that I was able to place a pterygoid implant on one side, and I was not able to place a pterygoid implant on the other side because where he had one of the impacted third molars, there just was not very much bone available in that area. But we were able to take this, change it to this, and take the patient from having no teeth for the last almost two years to having teeth that he could smile with and chew with and be happy with. And the pterygoid implants were able to contribute to that. And we utilize these in our office, I'd say definitely every week. And they have a number of uh, scenarios where they are very helpful, whether they be from planning from the start of the procedure, where we're going to eliminate cantilevers, to where we're utilizing them to rescue ourselves from areas where there's very soft bone and we don't have enough insertion torque and they're able to uh, save us to where we can place restoration on the same day where as in the past, we may have to uh, either not immediately load on the same day or place a whole bunch of additional implants to increase our CTV. Uh, so again, more information about pterygoid implants uh, will be contained in the textbook that will be coming out later this summer. Uh, that is available at pterygoidimplantbook.com. And uh, by going there and pre-ordering, you can save 25%. And at this point in time, uh, that concludes our lecture for the evening. And I'd like to go ahead and open the uh, internet for any questions that people may have and see if we could answer those for you.